This is Jose Merino, Editor-in-Chief of the Neurology Family of Journals. The Neurology Podcast provides practical information to neurologists and other clinicians to help them provide better care for their patients. Thanks for listening and have a great week. Hello and welcome. This is Justin Abadamarco with the Neurology Podcast, here with Mel Cara to discuss her latest paper published in Neurology titled, Efficacy and Safety of l in Individuals with Primary Mitochondrial Myopathy, the MM Power 3 Randomized Clinical Trial. Of note, this is the first Phase 3 trial in primary mitochondrial myopathies, which as we all know is desperately needed in this rare disease space and a really important milestone in this field. Amel is the Director of Mitochondrial and Lysosomal Disease Program at Massachusetts General Hospital and really excited to welcome her to the podcast. Hello. Hi, Justin, and thank you so much for having me today. Maybe we could start with some of the major takeaways from your work. Sure. The MM Power 3 trial is the largest double-blind placebo-controlled trial performed in patients with genetically confirmed mitochondrial myopathy to date. The goal was really to compare the efficacy and safety of the investigational compound alumepertide against placebo using a change from baseline to week 24 on the distance walked on the six-minute walk test and the total fatigue on the primary mitochondrial myopathy symptom assessment, which is a patient-reported outcome that we specifically developed for patients with mitochondrial myopathy. The study results demonstrated treatment did not improve outcomes in the six-minute walk test and the primary mitochondrial myopathy symptom assessment, which was very disappointing. Given the extensive genetic heterogeneity of the study population and exploratory analysis of the genetic subgroups by genomic alteration, specifically dividing them by mitochondrial DNA mutation and nuclear DNA mutation, was performed at the end of the study. And in the post hoc analysis of these subgroups, the primary mitochondrial myopathy participants who had a nuclear DNA defect were found to perform significantly better on the six minute walk test, whereas participants with the mitochondrial DNA mutation did not differ from placebo. Maybe we could take a step back and talk about this disease category in more detail. How do we define primary mitochondrial myopathies? What type of disorders does that entail, and how do these patients present to clinic? There was actually an international meeting and a consensus of international experts that tried to define what primary mitochondrial myopathies were, especially in the era of more clinical trial being interested in this category of patients. So what defines a primary mitochondrial myopathy is that it is a group of genetically confirmed disorders of the mitochondria that affects predominantly but not exclusively skeletal muscles which adversely affects the physical function and the quality of life of the subject. What this means is that these patients have mostly skeletal muscle abnormalities, but they can also have a multisystemic involvement with other organs that are affected by their mitochondrial disease. So the symptoms of primary mitochondrial myopathy can vary widely from one patient to another. And even within the same families with members affected by the same genetic mutation and having the same disease, these symptoms can differ widely. And the symptoms may include muscle weakness. It's mostly a proximal myopathy, but distal weakness has also been reported, especially in those advanced cases. There's a almost pathognomonic ocular muscle weakness that is very common in primary mitochondrial myopathy patient and leads to external ophthalmoplegia and bilateral ptosis. And the ptosis and the ophthalmoplegia can be so severe that they can significantly impact and reduce the vision. There could also be muscle atrophy, limited exercise capacity with exercise intolerance. Symptoms of fatigue and muscle pain or cramps are also common. More objectively, clinical findings may include elevated creatine phosphokinase or CPK, but normal levels do not exclude the presence of a primary mitochondrial myopathy. And in fact, several of our patients don't have an elevated CPK. Elevated growth differentiation factor 15 or GDF15, which is one of the newer mitochondrial myopathy biomarker, can be elevated, but again, being normal does not exclude the disease. On histopathology, we can see several findings that are highly concerning for a mitochondrial myopathy, like an altered cytochrome C oxidase staining or an altered succinate dehydrogenase staining. 
ragged red fibers, which are the proliferation of mitochondria at the edges of a muscle fiber, can be seen on a modified Gomori trichrome stain. We call these RRF fibers, and their presence on a muscle biopsy is highly suggestive of a mitochondrial myopathy in general. And finally, abnormally looking mitochondria ultrastructurally can be observed on electron microscopy as well. So as I said, the primary mitochondrial myopathy can vary widely in severity, and they are all almost progressive in nature, and they eventually impair the patient's ability to perform activity of daily living and can be associated with substantial morbidity. There are hundreds of different primary mitochondrial disorders in general, and although some of them have a predominant mitochondrial myopathy as the primary symptoms, Almost all of mitochondrial disorders have some degree of muscle involvement, with 90% of our patients reporting fatigue and exercise intolerance as a major bothersome symptom that they would like to be able to treat when asked what they wish to treat for their mitochondrial disease or primary mitochondrial myopathy. And these primary mitochondrial myopathy can be caused by both mitochondrial DNA disorders and nuclear DNA mutations. And together, they can be amongst the most common inherited metabolic disorders. So collectively, they are not so rare as diseases. And the way we diagnose these patients in the clinic is, of, of course, first of all, we have to suspect that they have a mitochondrial disease clinically. As I said, if there is specifically external ophthalmoplegia, ptosis, proximal myopathy, fatigue, exercise intolerance, with corroborating objective findings, we have to think of a primary mitochondrial myopathy and mitochondrial diseases in general. So as genetic testing has become more widely available and less expensive, more of these patients are being diagnosed routinely. Genetic testing is now the gold standard to diagnose primary mitochondrial myopathy. So if a specific canonical mitochondrial disease syndrome is suspected by clinical exam, the approach of using a targeted mutation analysis or a specific mitochondrial disease panel that can include anywhere from five to hundreds of mitochondrial disease genes or a full mitochondrial DNA genome sequencing are appropriate approaches to diagnose patients. If there is no canonical recognizable mitochondrial syndrome or disease, the first tier testing recommendation would be to get a whole exome sequencing with a full mitochondrial DNA sequencing, including deletion and duplication analysis. So whole exome sequencing, although sequences all the exomes in the nuclear gene does not sequence the mitochondrial DNA. And we know that for these patients, some patients have mitochondrial disease due to nuclear DNA defect, which is more common for pediatric cases. For the adults, it's mostly mitochondrial DNA mutation. So we have to do both whole exome sequencing and mitochondrial DNA sequencing. If available, whole genome sequencing could be used instead of the whole exome with the mitochondrial DNA sequencing because it would cover both the nuclear and mitochondrial DNA genomes. So it's a one-stop shop. If you are able to get a whole genome sequencing, that's what you should go for. Otherwise, whole exome with mitochondrial DNA sequencing. And one important thing to think about when you're testing for mitochondrial disease and, and specifically primary mitochondrial myopathies is that the tissue that you test matters. So we have several tissues that we can test nowadays, and we have the luxury of being able to send a blood sample, a buckled swab, saliva, urine, tissue like muscle and liver to clinical diagnostic labs. The specific choice of the tissue depends on the suspected disease. So for example, some um, one of the most common mit primary mitochondrial myopathy uh, cause is a mitochondrial DNA deletion. And that deletion in the adult patient can sometimes only be found in muscle tissue. So it's important to get a muscle biopsy to test that muscle tissue to find that deletion because it might not be recognized by blood testing or other tissues. 
So in doubt, always consult with a mitochondrial disease expert to get the most up-to-date information on what to test and how to test. And if you're in doubt as to where to find these mitochondrial disease experts, we do have a website that connects you to the mitochondrial care network in the U.S. And the website is www.mitonetwork.org. That's a lot of really good pearls and clinical thoughts because you're right, we have a diverse clinical presentation here. Some things that I heard that we have a wide range of clinical presentations, but when we're seeing progressive deficits with ptosis, ophthalmoplegia, proximal muscle weakness, exercise intolerance, we should at least think about mitochondrial disorders. I think one question that comes up commonly is this idea of a muscle biopsy versus genetic testing. And it sounds like we've really shifted as a field to genetic testing being the first line. Is that right? Correct. The muscle biopsy used to be the gold standard first-year testing many, many years ago. But now with the advent of genetic testing and the cost of genetic testing, it's really your first go to test. We reserve muscle biopsies to very few cases. We still do them, but very, very rarely. First, to diagnose patients with the specific mitochondrial DNA deletion, where we really need a tissue. Um, we sometimes use them in newborns if we are suspecting um, we have a differential for several uh, disorders that may cause muscle disease, and it, it's sometimes hard to figure out the genetic testing. Um, and we also use them if we find a variant of unknown significance in one of the genes that we tested, and we want to know whether that variant is really affecting the muscle. So as I said, we could do some specific stains for mitochondrial proteins and look at the ultrastructure of the mitochondria to help give us some further criteria area for diagnosis. And jumping back into your study, this idea that we have mutations both in a nuclear and a mitochondrial DNA, why did you think we had some differences in the response in this trial? Is there a biological reason that you see this discrepancy? The MTD population or the mitochondrial DNA population in this trial was confounded by a significant placebo effect, notably in individuals with a specific genetic mutation that can be seen in what we call the Mila spectrum disorder. This is specifically the M3243 HG mutation, one of the most common genetic mutation um, in general, but also in this patient population in this trial. So we had almost 30 patients in each arm having this specific mutation. But the encouraging response with alamepertide in the nuclear DNA population was not confounded by the placebo effect the same way as it was in the mtDNA group. So all of the mitochondrial proteins encoded by the nuclear DNA genes must be imported into the mitochondria across the mitochondrial inner membrane which contains the cardiolipin, the target of alamepertide, the investigational drug. So alamepertide may be also improving the mitochondrial import and or assembly of these protein encoded by the nuclear DNA, a concept that is supported by a number of non-clinical studies. Uh, some have been published, some have not been published yet. So we think maybe that has something to do as well with the reason why the nuclear DNA defect patient improved more so than the mitochondrial DNA patient patients in this specific trial. So there is some clear reasoning or biological possibility in why we saw that signal in that specific group, which is really interesting. Yes. One of the other challenges, and we see this across kind of neurological subspecialties, is helping to treat fatigue. So I treat multiple sclerosis patients often, and that is one of the most refractory features of the disease to treat. What challenges did you see in your trial with using that as an endpoint? So the reason we chose fatigue was because it was really identified as the primary issue that concerned our patient population. So we've done several studies through several groups and fatigue and exercise intolerance have been reported by, as I said, more than 90% of all patients, all comers with primary mitochondrial disease and more specifically with primary mitochondrial myopathy. And when these patients were asked if there was a miracle drug, what symptoms of your disease would you like to be treated? they all respond, I want my fatigue to get better. So logically, this was a low-hanging fruit for an endpoint for a clinical trial for primary mitochondrial myopathy. 
But fatigue in mitochondrial disease is very tricky, whereas in other neurological neurodegenerative diseases, there is constant fatigue throughout the days. The mitochondrial fatigue can fluctuate from day to day and even within the same day. It can acutely be exacerbated by stressors such as physical, emotional, and other stressors. It can become very severe, so the leading the patient to become bedridden. It can resolve for no specific reason and patient can feel so much better and are able to engage and do physical activity, which makes longitudinal assessment for fatigue very challenging in this patient population, including pinpointing a meaningful change on the fatigue scale, any fatigue scale, and pinpointing an intensity of a response to therapy signal that would rise beyond the natural history fluctuation of fatigue in this patient population. All of these make it very difficult to measure fatigue. On top of all of this, when we started doing our clinical trial in primary mitochondrial myopathy, we did not have a fatigue scale that was validated for this specific patient population. So we had to go back and try to create one and validate it. And that's how we developed the PMMSA fatigue scale that we used for this trial. So potentially refining the sensitivity of the PMMSA fatigue score in primary mitochondrial myopathy patient might further help us capture those signals that would be essential for future study to see whether a targeted investigational therapy is really efficacious or not. Since this trial has started, there have been many efforts by several groups in trying to identify more sensitive uh, fatigue scales. And the FDA has pushed for us to use or existing fatigue scales and to validate them in this patient population, which we have been doing. So we've looked at things like the modified fatigue intensity scale and the promised fatigue scale. So all of these are work in progress and we are hopefully getting very close to selecting a better fatigue scale. But I think the PMSA is very promising as well and we just need to work a little bit more on it to refine its sensitivity in this patient population. So I think fatigue overall is common in many diseases, but the nature of that fatigue is very different, even more so in our primary mitochondrial myopathy patient. And really picking the right, the most appropriate fatigue scale is very important for any clinical trial moving forward. Along those lines of symptom management, we're in a world where we don't have any clear approved treatment options for these patients. So how do you approach these cases with patients and caregivers alike? For the longest time, we have been telling our patients that there is no cure for their disease. And it's devastating, of course, as a patient to sit on the other side and hear those words. Actually, many of our patients told us that we shouldn't say there isn't a cure because there is treatment available. And that treatment includes mostly symptomatic treatment. So because mitochondrial myopathies and mitochondrial diseases in general affect several organ systems, we need the specific specialist for each organ to treat that organ regardless of the reason why that organ is malfunctioning. So if you have a cardiomyopathy, you would see cardiologist and they would treat the cardiomyopathy the same way that they would treat it if they had CHF. So every organ and organ system has to have a subspecialist to take care of it symptomatically. To treat the overall symptoms of mitochondrial myopathy, we for the longest time relied on something called the mitococktail. That's how the patient in our community call it, the mitochondrial cocktail. And it's not an alcoholic beverage, but it's a composite cofactors and vitamin concoction that we prescribed. So these contained most of the vitamins and the cofactors that are needed for that oxidative phosphorylation machinery to make ATP. And so the idea was if you give those cofactors and vitamins in higher doses and you try to push that oxidative phosphorylation pathway to produce more ATP, then that might be helpful for patients. So the cocktail includes things like coenzyme Q10 and riboflavin and antioxidants. And we used to prescribe many of these. We used to have a long list and we used to check all those boxes and it wasn't unusual for a patient to be on 10 or 15 of these cofactors. 
But in 2017, the Mitochondrial Medicine Society really dug deeper into the utility and the safety of prescribing patients so many. And they decided that uh, there were only three supplements and cofactors that would be recommended for patients with primary mitochondrial myopathy and mitochondrial diseases in general. And these would be riboflavin or vitamin B2, coenzyme Q10 in the form of ubiquinol, and alpha-lipoic acid, which is an antioxidant. So these were the only three where we had some evidence of efficacy through very small clinical trials looking at muscle strength improvement. And so we do recommend these for our patients. There are other supplements that you might find in the literature to improve several function of the mitochondria. And although those have been really helpful in vitro, we don't really have clinical trial at large scale in humans to show any efficacy. So we shy away from prescribing those. And if you are interested in knowing more about how we manage our patients with mitochondrial disease, we do have all the publication from the Mitochondrial Medicine Society freely available on the website, which is www.mitosoc.com. Org, and all this information is readily available there. Aside from these supplements and cofactors, we do recommend that all our patients eat very balanced, healthy meals several times a day. So instead of having three big meals, we recommend three smaller meals scattered throughout the day. So every three to four hours to eat lean proteins, healthy fats, and complex carbohydrates to hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Patients with mitochondrial disease tend to have some dysautonomia and need a lot of hydration. And we do recommend exercising. And that might be counterintuitive because the patients are mostly complaining of fatigue and exercise intolerance. But exercise has really been shown to improve mitochondrial health in general. So it promotes mitochondrial biogenesis. It enhances mitophagy for those abnormal mitochondria in the muscle. And so it kind of acts like gene therapy. And we do recommend that our patients do both strength training and cardiovascular exercise training at least three times a week. The intensity can be very low, very mild, and the exercise regimen can last five or 10 minutes as much as the patient can tolerate without overexerting themselves. But it's very important to have some form of exercise for patients. So to summarize, we do treat symptomatically. We do recommend some supplements. We do recommend a healthy diet with good hydration and specifically exercise, exercise, and exercise. It's nice to know that we have clear ways to intervene and help these patients, even without a clear pharmaceutical approach or you know, FDA-approved treatment option. And then I wanted to touch on that idea that you brought up with this message of hope. You know, I think Ted Burns, our founder for the podcast, always mentioned that on his journey, and it's resonated with me, especially as I've gone along and relaying that to patients. And I think I was hearing that with your talk when you are discussing this diagnosis and treatment plan, so that's important. Maybe we could end with some discussions more broadly, especially working in this rare disease space and the difficulty in organizing clinical trials. I think many neurologists face similar challenges. What kind of advice could you give them? What did you learn going through this process with this clinical trial? It's a challenge that we are all facing in the rare disease field. It's a good challenge to have, actually, because a few years ago, we were hoping to get to this point where we would have clinical trials. Fortunately, there are currently several investigational compounds and clinical studies for patients with primary mitochondrial disease and mitochondrial myopathy specifically. And there have been several gaps identified when we first started clinical trials in this space. So number one is having enough genetically confirmed primary mitochondrial myopathy patients and ensuring that patient met study inclusion criteria. It's one thing to have a patient with a disease, but it's another to find enough patients who meet the inclusion and exclusion criteria. And this is something very important when you're talking about a couple of hundred patients available for any clinical trial. We are rare disease in the rare disease space where we, we don't have the thousands of patients that die diabetes and heart disease have the luxury of having. Number two is also having in-depth understanding of the hundreds of distinct mitochondrial diseases, the different genes that cause the disease, the different pathobiologies, 
that causes. So enriching the study population by better understanding the way these diseases work might help us get a better response to investigational therapies by selecting the most appropriate patients for these clinical trials. Number three is, I think, identifying and validating a biomarker that is specific for mitochondrial diseases that can show mitochondrial improvement that correlates to clinical benefit from the investigational drug. We still don't have a biomarker for mitochondrial disease that we can use in clinical practice or in any clinical study or trial. And that is something that is very lacking and very important. And before, I think developing and validating outcome measures and endpoints for primary mitochondrial myopathy and disease that meet regulatory standards is very important. As we talked about for fatigue scales, we started with no validated outcome measures for mitochondrial disease. Since then, we have had several groups working on validating and developing some. The NIH has even funded a project through the NINDS to develop common data element for mitochondrial diseases, looking over all available outcome measure and endpoint and selecting those that were deemed most appropriate to validate for primary mitochondrial myopathy. But there's still a long way to go to try to validate these one by one and would require a lot of funding to do that. And finally, I think improving our understanding of the natural history of these rare diseases and mitochondrial disease specifically, how these diseases progress naturally, how do patients behave one month out, six months out, five years out, This information is crucial to help us improve our trial design and optimizing the duration of treatment and selecting the appropriate endpoint and the the powering studies adequately. So all of these were gaps that we kind of stumbled upon when we decided to start clinical trials in this space. Luckily, since we started, we had a lot of engagement from our community and organization. We now, in our mitochondrial medicine community, at least in the U.S., have developed clinical expert centers called the Mitochondrial Care Network. We have research consortia like the North American Mitochondrial Disease Consortium, which is a physician scientist curated patient registry and biorepository funded by the NIH. This is where we are trying to learn about those natural histories. We have several patient advocacy groups with their own self-reported patient registries. We have created clinical trial consortia like Treat Mito. All of these entities have been tirelessly working to address the mentioned gaps, and we are making good progress, so I'm very optimistic for the future. Amel, I just want to thank you for your time today. We really appreciate your efforts, but also providing some guidance around these mitochondrial diseases, when to suspect them in clinic. For our listeners, you can find the article in Neurology titled Efficacy and Safety of l in Individuals with Primary Mitochondrial Myopathies. Amel, thanks again. Thank you so much. This is Stacey Clardy, your podcast editor. Thank you for listening. And for letting us join you on your commute, while you're exercising, or even while you're brushing your teeth, this has been another episode of the Neurology Podcast, your best source of practical, relevant, and timely information for neurologists, clinicians, and patients.